This venerable drink is one of the oldest cocktails and is synonymous with New Orleans, but the exact origins of the Sazerac and, crucially, its space spirit is one of the bartending world's longest running arguments, and believe me, we have a few. So, should it be made with rye or cognac, or indeed both? Let's find out. Researching the Sazerac opened a can of worms, so I will present those worms to you and you can decide your favourite version of the history. If you'd rather jump straight into the action, then scroll forward to the chapter of your choice and we will also release um, shorter individual edits of these in the coming weeks, so hit subscribe if you haven't already and we will put links up here when they're done too. The Sazerac story, which I had always heard, was one made famous by Stanley Clisby Arthur. He said that Antoine Pechaud, a New Orleans pharmacist, liked to serve and drink his eponymous bitters mixed with cognac in little cups called coquetiers, and there will be more on this later. Meanwhile, another New Orleans-based businessman is importing brandy, specifically Sazerac du Forge Fille cognac. And it all gets a little bit fuzzy here, but basically that same man is also involved with the Merchant Coffee House, which despite the name is actually a bar. So the story goes that at some point there in around the 1850s, they would have started mixing the cognac with Peychaud's bitters, and this would have been known as a Sazerac cocktail. Around the 1870s, when absinthe was the cool new cocktail ingredient on the block, that got added to the mix much the way that bartenders nowadays are always trying to add dry sherry or amari to your drinks. The story then goes that phylloxera, which you may remember from the Brandy Cruster vs Sidecar episode, so it's a root disease that crippled France's wine and brandy industry and made cognac really hard to come by, and so rye was substituted, eventually becoming the norm. Now, Peychaud's coquetiers have also been promoted by New Orleans as the root of the word cocktail, which does rather conveniently crown them as the birthplace of the cocktail. However, enter David Wondrich, that great debunker of myths. Uh, he's widely acknowledged as the foremost cocktail historian in the world, and as such, he has a rather annoying habit of actually checking dates and looking at facts. And he pointed out that seeing as the first written instance of the word cocktail was in 1806 and Peychaud was born in 1803, he probably can't claim it. He also pointed out that the whole Peychaud's coffee house, cognac, Sazerac cocktail link is pure conjecture. And all we have as hard facts is a first written reference to a Sazerac cocktail in 1899, and that's definitely a rye cocktail, which was about to be bottled by the Sazerac company which had evolved with various different ownerships from the original Merchant Coffee House. Personally, I was a little bit confused because at some point in my career, I was taught that if someone asked for a Sazerac, I should ask if they wanted a New Orleans version, which would be full rye, or a New York Sazerac, which is split base between rye and cognac. And so far, there's been no mention of that last version in this story. So here I am already to start writing a script about the rivalry between New York and New Orleans styles and I gaily type New York Sazerac into the search engine and find nothing. After a few more tries, the only article about it I can find is in an Australian bartender's magazine, so I put it to the Melbourne Bartender Exchange hive mind. The response is overwhelmingly that while they would always ask the guest preference, their own favourite was a New York style. But then a few Americans start chiming in saying that they'd never heard of a New York Sazerac. The plot thickens. With a bit more digging and discussion, we figure out that Dale DeGroff, who is a bartender and author who's really at the forefront of the craft cocktail revolution we're experiencing now, he actually included a split base Sazerac as a nod to the cognac origins tale in his 2002 book Craft of the Cocktail, which is my bible and that of many of my peers when starting out in the industry. Now the Sazerac never really went away in the States, as much as it may have fallen out of fashion a bit, it was still always around, but for many international bartenders, seeing it in that book might have been the first time they'd ever even heard of the drink and not realised that that recipe was a bit unusual. De Groff is certainly not the only person to have experimented with this, but he is very influential and has strong ties overseas. And he's from New York, so the differentiation between his version and the New Orleans one kind of slipped into bartender parlance in the UK and Australia. Or at least, this is my supposition. And an important reminder that drinks culture is constantly changing and so we should keep our minds open. Basically, as always, drink it how you like it or ask your customer how they like it. 
But the true sort of based on facts classic Sazerac is a rye base. The split base is definitely perfectly acceptable but a modern variation. And as for cognac, as Reese on the Bartender Exchange put it, making a popular drink by the specs of a mythical 1800s recipe instead of asking the guest or giving them what they expect is the ultimate bartender wankery. So now we've sorted that mess out, let's see how they all taste. Hello again. If you are interested in signing up to our online bartending course with the International Open Academy, which you should be if you're thinking of a career behind the bar, you've only got a few days to take advantage of the launch special. Check out the details below for the best deals on offer. In the interest of very serious science, I'm going to use the same rye and cognac for all of the cocktails. As I mentioned in the history section, the Sazerac company evolved out of the Merchant Coffee House. So when Thomas H. Handy took it over, he started buying alcohol brands as well and marketing bottled cocktails, um, such as our very own Sazerac. But Sazerac is actually now the second largest liquor company in the US and owns really well-known brands like Buffalo Trace, George T. Stagg and Pappy Van Winkle. I do genuinely think that the Sazerac six-year-old rye makes a great Sazerac. It's really spicy, but still quite kind of juicy um, and has a lovely balanced fruitiness that works really well here as well. Um, and as we've discussed in our American whiskey deep dive, rye has to be rather unsurprisingly made from at least 51% rye grain. And I'd also suggest using a straight rye, i.e. one that's been uh, aged for at least two years because the cocktail does need that bit of kind of weight and smoothness that you get from a slightly older spirit. Um, Nog Creek's always a good go-to for me for a really good all-rounder um, or Rittenhouse if you want something with a little bit of funk to it. All cognac is brandy, but not all brandy is cognac because cognac is an appellation d'origin contrôlé and I'm sorry, no wonder French people never understood me when I lived there. Uh, but basically it guarantees and still does a certain quality standard, so it's often called for specifically in cocktail recipes. Um, Pierre Ferrand original formula 1840 was actually uh, done in collaboration with the aforementioned David Wondrich and tried to recreate the style of spirit that would have been used in cocktails sort of back around then. Um, so fruity, fresh and a bit higher ABV. So it carries really well in a cocktail like this. Peychaud's is the one true bitters here. Normally I'm all for substitutes, but if you don't have Peychaud's, it's not really a Sazerac. Uh, not that it wouldn't still be a delicious drink. The Sazerac company also produces these, apparently according to the original recipe. It is a little bit lighter and a little bit sweeter than Angostura and has quite a distinctive uh, sort of cherry and licorice note and that works really well with the absinthe rinse um, and kind of combines to give this cocktail its really distinctive flavour. There are some other Creole bitters on the market but honestly Peychaud's is the one that you're most likely going to be able to get your hands on. It's fairly widely available. And some bartenders will add other bitters. Uh, in fact, Dale de Groff even adds Angostura bitters in his. But I feel like they get quite enough attention in other drinks and I just like letting Peychaud's really shine in this one. Now, of course, absinthe had its own hiatus. Um, definitely something that we'll have to have a look at in some more detail. But basically it was illegal for a very long time and so Sazerac's moved to being made with herb sant. Uh, it's kind of similar to pastis in that it's a bit lighter and, and sweeter um, and it's also now produced by the Sazerac company and is still what would be used in New Orleans quite a lot. I do prefer using a real absinthe just for that little bit of extra spice and bite. It's obviously just a rinse so it doesn't have to be fancy but this is such a finely balanced cocktail that you can certainly use something a bit special if you can spare it. I'm using Perno or Lafay as another good and kind of quite inexpensive option. Traditionally, Sazeracs are actually made using two rocks glasses. So you mix a drink in one and then rinse the other with absinthe and serve it in that. It honestly doesn't make too much of a difference and I find it easier to stir and control the dilution in just a regular mixing glass. So I stick to that. Sazeracs are served up, but uh, so not on ice, but in a rocks glass. So that's fairly unusual, but actually quite nice because if you have any cute little glasses, which are too small for things like old fashions, then now is their time to shine. It did cause us a little bit of difficulty trying to find three different ones for today, but we just about managed it. And then to rinse the glass, I was always taught to fill the glass with ice and then add a little splash of absinthe, just around 10 mils. Give it a quick stir and it can just sit there sort of chilling and flavoring the glass as you build the rest of the drink. Of course, you can just use an atomizer or sort of roll the absinthe around the glass as we've done with other drinks like the Corpse Reviver number two. But adding water to the absinthe also helps to release some non-soluble flavor compounds. 
Not gonna get too far into it here because we'll definitely do a more detailed deep dive on absinthe at some point, but it's basically what's known as the ouzo effect. Um, so when certain alcohols have, have water added to them, they go a bit milky, but stay in solution. It's a really quite interesting scientific phenomenon. If you're a bit of a geek like me, then I'll drop a link below for you. But anyway, so adding the ice and the absinthe not only chills the glass, but it also releases some of those more subtle star anise flavors that you get in a really good quality absinthe. Um, it's a really simple form of an absinthe louche, which you might have seen, where you drop water into your absinthe, you know, preferably from a beautiful and ornate Art Deco fountain. And then the reason that I do um, this here, but not in some other cocktails is kind of two reasons. Uh, a, I feel that those more subtle nuances are knocked out by the citrus in something like a Corpse Reviver. Uh, and B, it's actually a perfectly acceptable and nice serve with the Sazerac to give your guests a little louched absinthe on the side of their drink. And then they can kind of try it individually, which is another reason why it can be nice to use a nice absinthe here. And they can just sort of sit and ruminate on that. The lemon peel garnish is traditionally a twist and discard here. So, you know, it's a drink where everything comes together in harmony. And so you want to actually expel the twist from a bit of a height. So it's more of a gentle waft rather than a smack in the face. Many recipes similarly to the old fashioned do call for a muddled sugar cube. And that was undoubtedly how it used to be made. As always, I opt for sugar syrup just for more control and consistency. Um, and I just prefer the smoother texture but of course feel free to use a cube if you prefer. And I also adjust the sugar depending on which base spirit I'm using. So obviously cognac's already got quite a nice fruity sweetness to it. Um, so I use a little bit less than I do for your sort of dry and spicy rye. Now, just last thing before we get to the making, a wee bit of housekeeping. If you don't already know, we've got a website where you can search for all of the cocktails we've made on the channel. You can find it at withcaradivine.com and you can even sign up to our mailing list don't worry, we won't spam you. All of those who have already signed up can attest that we're actually yet to send out our first newsletter. Uh, but like many things with this channel, we are working on it. I'd also like to quickly thank some of our Patreon patrons, James, Jake, Kevin, Joel, Jim, Bill, Mole and Alice. Also to Edwin and Bar Under the Stairs who missed out on the shout out first time round. Thank you to everyone who's signed up in the last couple of months and taken advantage of the annual discount. Your contributions mean that we can finally put some time towards exclusive content for you, like the Q&A that we will be doing after this. Sazerac, anyone? First up, let's take a look at the mythical cognac version. As always, we're gonna prepare our garnish first. Um, because this isn't actually going in the drink, it really doesn't have to be particularly pretty. So just as much as you need to take off to think that you're gonna get a nice little uh, expression of oils over the top. So just a little spot. And that means you can obviously get a few off a lemon, especially if you are in a bar environment and making these. And then we'll get our absinthe rinse ready. Um, so just grab your little glass out of the fridge or freezer. It's what I figured would be maybe the closest to Antoine Peychaud's little uh, coquetier. So we'll start with this for that one. So just pop a little bit of ice in there. And about 10 to 15 mils of absinthe. You can obviously measure this if you like, but um, I just tend to eyeball it. And just try and kind of pour it around the edge a little bit so that you're sort of drizzling on the way down. And give that a little stir. Leave it to do its thing. And then we'll start with just a little bit five mils of sugar syrup, obviously adjust it to your taste. Um, but I do tend to think, especially with the cognac being quite kind of rich and fruity anyway, the sugar is just really there as like a, a little kind of almost thickening agent as a little bit of viscosity and obviously balances out the bitters slightly. But it certainly shouldn't be a sweet drink, this one. I would knock it back a little bit from, from kind of what you would do with an old fashioned. And then we'll go for four dashes of Peychaud's bitters, a little bit more than you often use with bitters, but they are really a kind of very key component of this drink here. And then a good 60 mils or two shots of your cognac. Then we're gonna fill this one with ice and give it a little stir. Give it a little taste. Mm. Yum. So at this point, we're just gonna um, actually keep, as you can probably see here, so the absinthe has gone that kind of interesting milky 
uh, way that I've said, which means that it's releasing lots of other kind of yummy flavors. And then we can um, strain it out into a shot glass. And you can just dump out the rest of the ice there. And then use your julep strainer to hold the ice back and pour in here. Such a pretty color. Then we'll get a little orange twist and give it a sharp fold over the top of the drink. I don't bother running it around the rim or anything as I do with other ones, because again, it's not really meant to be a dominant flavor. And you can just get rid of this guy. And there we have a cognac Sazerac. Now for our rye, or you know, as a lot of people um, say, the correct Sazerac, we're gonna get our lemon peel uh, ready as well. And then we'll just grab our uh, glass out of the fridge or freezer and get that chilling with some absinthe. And give it a nice stir. And that can just sit on the side and sort of do its thing. So we'll start with about 10 mils of sugar syrup. This is very much to taste. Um, I do use a little bit more with rye than when I'm making it with cognac because rye tends to be a little bit drier. Although Sazerac is, does have a really nice fruitiness to it, so you might not need even quite as much as that, just depending on you know, your palate. And then we'll go four dashes of Peychaud's bitters. It's very much a, a star ingredient in here, so you wanna make sure it comes through, plus it makes it very pretty and pink, which I'm always into. And then 60 mils of rye. Uh, just fill your mixing glass up with ice. And then we're gonna give it a little stir. I do tend to like to give this a good amount of dilution because obviously it's not being served on the on the rocks, so sort of as you know as diluted as it is is how diluted it's gonna get. So when you give it a little taste, you're just wanting to make sure that there's not any you know real kind of alcohol burn. Here, as much as it's very boozy, it should be, um, you know, quite a kind of like rich and smooth and you're not looking for, for a real bite. Whereas obviously sometimes in something like a Negroni or an old fashioned that you're gonna serve on the rocks, it's okay to have a little bit less dilution to start off with. So the first couple of sips are a bit like, you know, a bit of a wake up call. And obviously don't do this if you're now gonna give it to a customer, but if you stick your nose in, you can definitely smell that that's, you know, kind of nice and coated and, and got all that lovely aniseed flavor coming through. So we're just gonna pour, holding your, using your julep strainer to hold the ice back in here. And then get your little lemon twist or lemon coin and just hold it a little bit further up than maybe you usually would and give it a sharp fold over the top. And there we have a rye Sazerac. So now for our modern or split base Sazerac. And then this one, I put 7.5 mils of sugar syrup because it's sort of halfway between what we've done for the cognac and the rye. Really, it's kind of personal preference. You can go obviously a little bit less or a little bit more depending on your own palate. And then four good dashes of the Hero Peychaud's bitters. And then 30 mils of our rye. It smells so good. And then 30 mils of cognac. Then we'll just fill our mixing glass with some ice. I think that's two out of three that I managed to do without spilling any anywhere, which is better than usual. <laughs> and then we'll just give it a little stir by um, holding the back of your spoon against the inside of the glass. This one does take a, a nice bit of dilution. You know, both of the spirits are quite kind of strong and bold and can stand up to it. And obviously you're not serving it on ice, so you do want it to be nice and smooth and not have any kind of harsh alcohol burn when it uh, goes in to join the absinthe there.
Delicious. It just went down the wrong way. <laughs> I think that might have been slightly more than 10 or 15 mils that I put in to begin with. I'm like, oh no, the last one that I actually get to drink is massive. <laughs> no, not with absinthe. It's not a, not as much my jam. And then uh, just use your julep strainer to hold the ice back in the mixing glass and give it a little pour into your absinthe rinse glass. Hold your lemon twist a little bit higher than you normally would. And there you have a modern split base Sazerac. I'm actually quite excited to do this because I haven't ever done a side-by-side -side comparison. We kind of, I guess it, it almost would be nice to do a blind tasting because I sort of know what my, what I think is going to be my favorite, but it will be interesting to see if that's how it pans out. Uh, so I guess we'll start at the start. You actually get a really nice, like little kind of quite almost yeah, red fruited cherry whiff, which I guess is from the Peychaud's, but playing really nice. I, I quite often get that from brandy and cognac as well. It's really yummy. I wasn't sure. I mean, I think, yeah, definitely having the sugar quite low on this one, because that was literally just five mils and that's plenty, um, in my opinion. The absinthe doesn't come through heaps and heaps, but it's just got this lovely little kind of savory finish to it, um, which is quite a, a nice balance after having quite a kind of real fruit sort of punch up front from uh, from the bitters and the, and the um, cognac. But it's quite round and rich um, and definitely a little bit less spicy than the ones that I'm kind of used to. Um, so we'll see how it holds up. Yeah, so this one's way more spicy on the nose already, getting heaps of sort of your more kind of woody um, rye spice. And the absinthe is actually, I can smell it more. I mean, it, obviously this one's actually been made slightly longer, so that could just be that it's dissipated slightly, but I can de I'm definitely getting it way more on the nose as well. That's really yummy. Um, I think it is just one of those ones that like as I said everything kind of just comes together quite nicely in this and in, in the other one I can definitely sort of sort of know what I'm drinking in terms of each of the individual ingredients and they're all a little bit linear this just all comes together to be a very delicious and well-balanced drink I can see why this has uh, held America in thrall for quite a while now and then last but not least, our little modern version and our slightly more jaunty modern uh, glass. Okay, I think it's not fair because it is just because this was made last, you're getting heaps of absinthe. <laughs> so probably discount what I've said about the, the nose on the other two. I mean, I know it sounds like a cop-out, but it is just the best of both worlds because you have that roundness and richness, which is maybe missing a little bit from the rye one. Um, it is a little bit more kind of, yeah, a little bit drier and not thin, like it's definitely a very, you know, full-bodied and full-flavored cocktail, um, but that just quite, like it's almost juicy uh, in, in its fruitiness um, and you still get that from the cognac, but with all the spice and that really lovely savory end from the absinthe and that really nice interplay of the cherry, um, kind of cherry and vanilla notes in the Peychauds and in all of it. I mean, yeah, it's potentially just biased, but I thought I was gonna like this one best and I do. <laughs> so there you are. Dale de Groff nailed it in my opinion, but they are all very delicious drinks. So now you know all about the Sazerac, why not let us know which one you prefer?